praying is serious business with God. I'm talking to the creator of the whole earth. I'm talking to the one who doesn't have to speak. He can just think it into being. I'm talking to a God who can change anything, anywhere, anytime, according to his will. Next on In Touch, prayer that moves God. You often wonder why your prayers are unanswered. You know some scriptures, and you talk to God, but somehow so many of your prayers go unanswered. There must be some reason. Have you thought about why? Have you looked at your life to ask the question, is there anything in my life that would cause God not to answer my prayers? I wonder if you've thought about this. Have you thought about the God to whom you are making your prayers? You say, well, everybody believes in God. Well, everybody doesn't believe in the one true God. And many people pray to a God, and they expect God to answer their prayers, and somehow they don't get answered, and so you give up on praying, and you, th you say, well, the Bible's not really true. The Bible's very true from very beginning to the very end. So I want you to listen carefully to this message because it just may be that you'll discover one of those reasons your prayers are unanswered. Listen carefully. So turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 12. This is a familiar passage, and um, I want us to read a few verses, but we'll take probably most of this chapter. Beginning in verse 1, the Scripture says, Now about that time Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now, it was during the days of the unleavened bread after the Passover. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers. Now, four squads would be 16. They were there to guard him and uh, to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. Now remember that. It was made fervently by the church to God. Would you say that you pray fervently? Or do you just say, well, I, I don't know whether it's fervently or not, but I just pray. Well, Let's look at what's going on right here and maybe discover something about your own prayer life. So, this Herod, he had James killed. And uh, that seemed to satisfy the Jews who hated the Christians. And so, then he thought that worked. So, he had Peter arrested and put in prison. So, Peter is now in prison, and um, his death is imminent. It's very evident that he intends to kill him that he intends to bring him out before the people and uh, kill him with a sword as he did uh, James. And he figured that that would satisfy the Jews by killing Christians. And so the result is that the Christians gather together, the Scripture says, in Mary's house. And uh, there they gather together to pray for Peter. Now remember, probably James was killed without any warning. And so, here's Peter, their leader who is going to be killed. They know he's going to be killed. And so, they're praying, but they have to be struggling to some degree with that because James has already died. And uh, they know how a prisoner is imprisoned by the Romans. And so, they're praying and praying for God to release him. And so, uh, I want us to just read a few verses here, if you will. And um, look, if you will, verse 6. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And uh, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side, woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself put on your sandals, and he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. 
And he went out and continued to follow, and he did not know what was being done but by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing something, having a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. So, so what happens? When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. Now, I want you to think about something. The two words here that really got my attention when I read this, and I read it many times, if you go back to the fifth verse, notice what it says. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently, listen, fervently by the church to God. And those two words just jumped off the page to me, to God. If I should ask you, who is the God you are praying to? More than likely, most of you seated here and most of you who are believers could say, well, I'm praying to the one true God that uh, when I pray, He's the one I think about. But I want you to think about the people who pray who don't necessarily pray to the one true God. And um, what I've discovered is this. When I talk to somebody who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they talk about praying, I'll say, well, who do you pray to? Well, I just pray to God. Well, like, like who, who is this God? Well, He's the God I pray to. And the more you talk to them, the more you listen. Here's what you discover. Many people have mentally created their own God. And this God agrees with them about what they want to do, where they want to go, how they want to dress, what they want to drink, or what kind of sexual relationships they'll have. In other words, this God just fits them perfectly. And so they say, do I believe in God? Yes, I do. You pray to Him? Yes, I do. What do you say to Him? Well, now you're getting personal. I'm not going to tell you what I pray to Him. They can't because He's not God. He is a God that they've created in their minds. But listen, they will never tell you He's holy, He's righteous, He's a God of judgment, He hates sin. They're not going to say that. They're going to talk about the God who has patterned His desires after their desire, the way they live. And so many people, when they're praying, they're not praying to God. So somebody says, well, what kind of God does a Christian pray to? I'll tell you. He is the God who created this world. He's the God who destroyed this world by flood. He's the God who gave us the Ten Commandments. He's the God who broke down the walls of Jericho. He's the God who gave to David the Psalms. He's the God who's given to us the prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel. He is the God who has given to us the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God and our Savior. Now, if that's not the God you're praying to, you've got a homemade God and it doesn't work. He's a holy God. He's a righteous God. He's a perfect God. He's a God who hears and answers prayers. He's a God who loves us unconditionally. He's a God who forgives us of our sin, but He's a God who does not tolerate sin because He knows that sin is a destroyer of the very people He loves. If you don't have that God, you don't have God. You have a homemade God. You have one that suits you, listen to this, who has no power to promise you anything. Nothing. We can say, because of the Scripture, absent from the body, present with the Lord. What can you say about your God? I can tell you what you say. Well, I guess I just, everything just goes to nothing. I just disappear. No, you don't. Well, um, I guess uh, God is a God of love. He treats everybody the same. No, He doesn't. You can come up with all kind of excuses about your God, but you do not talk about judgment. You do not talk about righteousness. You do not talk about a day of judgment. You do not talk about standing before a holy God and giving account for your life. And I notice you don't talk about hell. You may talk a little bit about heaven because you believe that everybody's going there. Is that really true? No, it's not. And so your God is God to you but your God can't do anything for you. 
He has no power whatsoever because it is a God of your imagination. The God who is the one true eternal God is the God we just described a few moments ago. He's the God who gave us the Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes and all the awesome scriptures we have in the Bible. Now, the reason I ask you what God you're praying to is because if you're not praying to the one true God, it's not making any difference in your life. Now, these Christians hearing about Peter's imprisonment, they got together. And they began to pray and to intercede for him. And it's interesting when you look at this passage and think about what was getting ready to happen, that even in their prayers, they had to be struggling a little bit. I think I would have been, if I'd have been one of them. And so from all human perspective, every human perspective, Peter was going to be killed tomorrow. That is, tomorrow is D-Day for Peter, death for Peter. And so they got together at Mary's house and began to pray. And they were crying out for God to do something unusual, to do something awesome for them, because he, he meant so much to them. And, and if for him to be killed would have been a total disaster in their thinking, and especially uh, in what was happening in the church. So we saw a few moments ago what happened. So Peter's in prison. God sends his angel, takes him out. And then he uh, goes to Mary's house. He knew that's where they were all praying. Knocks on the door. And uh, this young lady comes to the door. The Scripture says, when he knocked at the door at the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, you'd think she would have, run, she would have opened the door and run, run back and said, well, here's Peter. No, what she did, she heard him, and she, she didn't even open the door. She just ran back and said, uh, it's Peter. And what do they say? Oh, it can't be Peter. It may, may be an angel, but it can't be. But he's still standing there kind of knocking, trying to get in. And they're in there deciding it can't be him. I mean, they've been praying fervently for God to set him free, and he sets him free, and they're still back there saying, no, it can't happen. <laughs> so that'll give you some wandering faith. And so uh, they said to her, you're out of your mind. Now, look at this. They've been there praying, crying out to God. She says, he's at the door. They say, you're, at the, you're out of your mind. And so she kept insisting. And so, but Peter continued knocking. And I wonder what he was thinking. And when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. So God answered their prayer. What I want us to look at here, and I want us to say this again and again, because I don't want you to, um, I don't want you to miss this. The Bible says, they were praying to God. Let me ask you, how many of you pray to God? How many times have you gotten on your knees and began to talk to God about what you were concerned about? And then you went from praying about your husband, your wife, or children, or your finances, whatever it is. Next thing you know, you're praying about something else. Next thing you know, you're praying about something else. In fact, in fact, you, you've prayed all over the world, and then you get up and walk away. About a, two hours later, somebody says, well, you pray, yeah, what did you pray about? Well, I've prayed about a lot of things. When you pray to God, you're going to know what you prayed about. Now, listen carefully. What happens is, in our mind, we fix our mind upon God to pray to Him. And we quote him a verse. God, you said, if I ask anything in your name that you do, it. I'm asking this in Jesus' name, praying to you. And so we start praying, and next thing you know, we're off to something else, and God gets lost in the whole issue. And finally, uh, the way we put a period to it, we say, in Jesus' name, amen. We don't even know what that means. In Jesus' name, amen. So, so much of our praying is not profitable because we don't pray to God. I'm praying to God about my finances. I'm praying to God about my husband or wife. I'm praying to God about my children. I'm praying, in other words, he must be uppermost in our praying and our thinking. Otherwise, we drift off into all kinds of things, as we said before, and sometimes can't even remember what it was. But God is uppermost, foremost. I'm praying to the Heavenly Father about this, and I'm not going to go praying along and get off on something else and forget to whom I am praying and what he's like. God is honored when we come to him. 
He's honored when we talk to him, and he's willing to hear and answer our prayer. He says, call unto me. I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. If he can part the Red Sea, knock down the walls of Jericho, and if he can give us the Ten Commandments, he can answer any prayer we pray that fits his will and his plan for our life. And so, so I want you to notice something else here about them. It says, the Scripture says, so uh, for him, uh, prayer was being made fervently by the church, fervently. You know what that means? There's some enthusiasm, there's some feeling, there's some belief, fervently. Let me ask you a question. Do you love your children fervently? Sure you do. Fervently means my heart is in it. When I'm talking to God fervently, it means I'm, I want to quote Him a Scripture. And we quote Scripture in our prayer not to remind God of anything, but to do what? To remind us of what He's promised us when we come to Him praying to Him. And so to pray fervently, for example, when Jesus was facing the cross, the Scripture says He was praying in Luke, the 22nd chapter, He was praying fervently. That is, he was agonizing. And I wonder when is the last time you could honestly say, I prayed fervently for him. That means you put your whole heart into it. It means you, you probably, maybe it were weeping in their behalf, that, that you were saying, God, I'll do whatever you say do, Wh whatever it takes to help them through this situation they're going through. God, in Jesus' name. And so, fervently, it means you're, it's wholeheartedly. And oftentimes we say to somebody, I'll pray for you. We don't, we shouldn't say that if we don't mean it. Now, if I tell somebody I'm going to pray for them, I'm going to pray for them. I want to do something to, to remind me that I told them I'd pray for them. And so sometimes I say, uh, make a list. Now watch this. If you want God to do something, many things, coming to Him one time is not going to cut it. It's not. Because some issues and situations, God has to have time to arrange the situations in order to answer your prayers. So if you just pray once and say, well, God didn't answer my prayer, you didn't give Him an opportunity to answer your prayer the way He wants to answer it, in the way that He gets the most credit, and that you're blessed, and you're reminded next time you have a request, that's the way you come to Him. He says, Call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know about. You don't even understand. And so, if I say to you, do you have a list? Let's put it this way. If you are dead serious about your prayer life and about the people you're praying for, you're going to do something that reminds you to keep praying until God changes the circumstance. And that's why I have a list. You say, well, what kind of list? You just put it at the top of it, prayer list, and right then you can put that name down. And the good thing that I found out a long time ago was to put a date down by it. This is a date I started. It may be three days when I can put another date down, answered prayer. It may be three months, six months, and I've prayed for people longer than that. And some people I've prayed for and prayed for and prayed for, I still can't put a date down by it. But look, watch this. But at least I'm reminded, at least I can still pray for that person, for God to change them in some way or provide something in their life. The issue is, am I praying with fervency because I love this person because I care? Not going to pray for everybody the same. You're not going to. The closer people are to you, the more you're going to probably pray for them. The more sincere your prayers are going to be the more intense, intensely you're going to pray for somebody that you genuinely love or somebody that you see heading in the wrong, wrong direction. And there have been people I've said, don't do that. Don't do that. I'm telling you, don't do it. They'd, and they head out in that direction. I pray, God, let them stumble, let them fall, let them hurt, whatever's necessary, block them. Just block them from ruining their life. It's not going to be any profit to me to pray for God to block something for them. I want to see God work in their life. And so, he says we're to pray fervently. And then the third thing I wanted you to notice here is simply this, and that is prayer that moves God. 
may be made by those in agreement with each other, in agreement with each other, and in the will of God. For example, if, if I have a big burden on my heart about something, I'm going to talk to somebody sitting right here, for example, and I'm going to say to that person, here's the thing I'm really concerned about, and let you, let you and I pray about this together. There's something, watch this, there's something about agreeing. If any two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything of the Father's will, he gets involved. And so there's something about praying together. And let's put it this way. The deeper your hurt, the more your pain, the more likely you're going to ask somebody to pray with you. Not just pray for you, but to pray with you. And if I should ask you today, how many of you have a prayer partner? Well, so I don't need anybody praying for me. Yes, you do. We all need somebody to pray for us. We need somebody to pray for us to warn us if we're heading in the wrong direction. And I've had people come up to me over the years and say, well, now, are you sure about this and so? And uh, a godly, if a godly person says to me, are you sure that that's the right thing to do? Here's what I'm going to say. I'm not going to I'm not going to be prideful and egotistical and say, well, absolutely, I'm sure. No. If you question that, I'm going to say, God, I want you to clarify this in my mind to be sure I'm heading in the right direction, asking the right thing for the right purpose, the right motive, and so forth. God is so willing to grant us the needs, the desires of our heart. When we come to Him with a clean heart, an open mind willing to listen to Him, willing to be obedient to Him. So the most powerful thing you and I do is to pray. We're to pray to God. We're to pray with fervency, with heart. We're to pray in His will, what He wants and what He desires for our life. And one of the best things we can do, watch this, it helps us and helps somebody else, is to have someone we pray with. Watch this, because we all need to be held accountable. A person who wants no accountability is into something they shouldn't be into. That's why they don't want to have to give an account. Accountability is a safety zone for us. For what I say, where I go, who I go with, what I spend, in other words, I want to be accountable. That's, that's safe. Somebody I says, I want freedom. You want freedom to destroy your life? Freedom to get in debt? Freedom to have relationships with people you have no business having relationships with. Accountability is a safety net for every single one of us. And God knows we all need to be safe, safe walking in His will and in His way. So the church in these days, they were smart. They all got together and prayed for Peter's release, and much... <laughs> Much to their surprise, he was released. <laughs> and what happens? Peter lived a long time after that. Now, I'd simply ask you this. If you had to describe your prayer life, what would it be like? Well, I say my prayers at night. Well, let's, let's get this. What do you mean say your prayers at night? I understand what you're saying, but if you just pray at night before you go to sleep, I can tell you right now, you're going to get in trouble. Because first of all, you may be about two-thirds sleep before you start praying. <laughs> so you don't even know what you're saying. In other words, you might as well say the prayer that I remember my mother taught me very early in life before I knew what was going on. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. <laughs> That's better than nothing, but... Uh, <laughs> It isn't the best kind of praying. <laughs> now, we laugh about it, but prayer is serious business. Praying to Almighty God through His Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and shed His blood for your sins. Praying to be saved to Almighty God through His Son, Jesus. Serious business. Praying for our needs, serious business. Praying for one another, serious business. Praying for the nation, serious business. Prayer is serious business. Listen, not only serious, it's powerful business. Praying with fervency makes change in people's lives, and it can make change in a nation. And God's people need to be praying. Amen? Amen. 
And Father, we thank you that you are pleased when we pray, willing to hear us, willing to answer us, willing to strengthen us, willing to build our faith up, willing to teach us how to love you. And we pray today in Jesus' name right now. Any person seated here, any person listening, wherever they might be, if their prayers are to count, help them to understand. First of all, they must make a personal commitment of their life to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, which opens the door to prayer and makes it possible. And before that happens, there's null and void. There is only talk. And so we pray that somebody today would be saved. Maybe, maybe many people would be saved. But Lord God, that you'd have your way in their lives. And in each one of us who calls ourselves Christians, who names the name of Jesus, that you would guide us, that all of us would be praying people. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been blessed by today's program, please visit us at intouch.org.